Morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Surgery Live. A um, few reminders before we get started here. Remember to turn on your web camera uh, so we, if you're able to, just so we can interact and uh, make this a better discussion. With that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to our uh, pediatric surgery chair here on Surgery Live, Dr. Tony DeRoz, who's going to be talking about an anterior mediastinal mass in a 16-year-old. Tony, over to you. Hey, thanks, Dr. Rosen. Uh, hope everybody can hear me okay. Please let me know if there are any technical difficulties. I'm going to try this uh, screen sharing option here. Just dive right into it. So this is a case of a 16-year-old patient with an anterior mediastinal mass. Uh, she's an otherwise uh, healthy female who, on Valentine's Day this year, developed uh, left facial paralysis that was originally thought to be Bell's palsy. One week prior to presentation, she developed worsening cough, fever, and shortness of breath with associated, um, well, fever, uh, chills, weight loss of 10 pounds, uh, and uh, fatigue. So uh, she looked pretty bad in the emergency department and uh, was admitted directly to the PICU. Uh, on exam, she was uh, noticeably dyspneic was lying with her right side down, uh, was mildly tachycardic, uh, tachypnic, uh, and uh, blood pressure was okay. Her uh, mildly hypertensive, perhaps due to anxiety. Uh, her um, sats uh, were okay on high flow uh, nasal cannula oxygen. So this was her chest x-ray, uh, which, you know, from across the room uh, appears concerning. Um, there's a opacification of the right uh, hemithorax um, and maybe some hint that that there's something going on in the in the central chest. Um, so obviously the the next step was a CT scan um, and it's uh, again very noticeable she's got uh, a large right pleural effusion. And this is these uh, cuts on her CT are from superior down to inferior uh, in the chest. So she's got a very large right pillar effusion. There's this large mass that has some central necrosis. Some other notable findings include compression of the uh, right main stem bronchus and the bronchus intermedius, uh, as well as uh, uh, kind of uh, complete compression of her superior vena cava can't even really see it here. You can see a hint of it here. It then disappears on this middle cut. Um, and then here's the, the heart uh, kind of displaced over to the left and inferior in the mediastinum. So again, massive right pleural effusion, large centrally necrotic anterior mediastinal mass measuring up to 13 centimeters in the largest dimension. The trachea and the left-sided airways uh, central airways were patent, but the right main stem and the bronchus intermedius uh, were attenuated on the CT scan. So I'll open this on up to a, a poll uh, and just see what people think the most likely diagnosis might be for this patient uh, in this pediatric patient. Is it a neuroblastoma? Uh, and it can be more than one uh, neuroblastoma, teratoma, thymoma, uh, lymphoma, or a bronchogenic cyst. Let's see, I see Dr. Vilchez is on the line. Um, Dr. Vilchez, what are what are some of the 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 uh what's an uh one uh mnemonic that we think of uh for the masses in the mediastinum and particularly the anterior mediastinum? So we think about the mnemonic of the T's. What so, are those? So we think about, you know, like thymomas. Uh, we we think about you know possible teratomas as well. We think yeah. about you know um, in that position we can think about also that it, it could be a lymphoma. You know though you know the age also can be taken into consideration if it's younger. You know like like this patient. Um, I think those are in my you know in my perspective what the most you know the one of one of the di diagnoses that I would just think about. You know. Good. And the, the other one that you left, there's four T's, teratoma, thymoma, uh, terrible lymphoma, and, and thyroid would be yeah, the other thyroid, one correct. Up, we, that we left off. But um, but yeah, what, Steve, it looks like um, we got we got a lot of votes for, or not a lot, but 
um, some votes for thymoma, teratoma, and lymphoma, one neuroblastoma or a couple of neuroblastomas out there. Um, but why don't we go back to the, uh, I guess I can sh reshare my screen here. And, uh, and yeah, Val, you were actually uh, absolutely right. Teratoma, thymoma, and lymphoma are all in the differential. And just to remind people, uh, neuroblastomas are more commonly in the posterior mediastinum. Um, these middle three, B, C, and D, are more commonly in the anterior mediastinum, and then mediastinum in a bronchogenic cyst, which this doesn't really look like, but it can be in the middle mediastinum uh, as well. So different things to think about based on the location of the mass in the mediastinum. So um, we uh, were consulted on this patient uh, and requested uh, by hematology oncology to place a right pleural chest tube to drain the effusion. Uh, they wanted a lymph node biopsy because she also had some palpable lymph nodes in her neck, and the most prominent ones were in her left axilla that we thought would be easy to get. And they also wanted some access, so they asked for a femoral central line, thinking that uh, it would be more difficult to get a, uh, a central line in the uh, uh, great vessels in the chest because of the mass itself. So um, so when when we got that consult, we we obviously thought, about the considerations that we might want to take uh, for this patient uh, when considering surgery. And what might those include? We'll open this one to the audience too. A, uh, uh, precautions that might be considered for surgery in a patient with an anterior mediastinal mass might include uh, during doing the procedure using a non depolarizing neuromuscular blockade agent, uh, B, preparations for emergency cardiopulmonary bypass, or positioning the patient in Trendelenburg position. So while we're, while we're here, I'll just have, uh, I'll ask Dr. Sung, who is our uh, expert anesthesiologist on the line who was involved in the case as well. What do you think about the use of a non-depolarizing uh, neuromuscular blockade agent in, in a patient like this way? Good morning. Uh, thanks for your invitation that uh, I was fortunately uh, involved in this case. And uh, thank you for the easy question, by the way. And any, any uh, pediatric anesthesiologists or anesthesiologists in general will be easy to tell you don't ever uh, paralyze the patient, secure airway for any other reason otherwise for somebody with a secondary mediastinal mass. So, yeah. So, the so upfront wait. consideration will never want to paralyze the secure the airway. Right. So, we, we don't want to paralyze them. Why not, Wei? Well, um, the general, you know, understanding is that uh, patients in the uh, respiratory distress room, either that spinal mass, even asymptomatic, you know, they consent, you know, their feeling is they are compensating on their own with a normal respiratory tone to maintain the airway patency uh, or vessel patency. By changing the dynamic of paralyzing a patient converts from uh, spontaneous to mechanical ventilation to a positive ventilation, you can cause an immediate uh, airway collapse. In this particular case, as you have illustrated in CD scan, they're already demonstrated compression in the airway. So that is a no brainer for us as far as uh, what we were trying to avoid. Exactly. Well, thanks, Wei. And I can see, you know, it, that was good information. Some some people actually picked that option. So it's good, good that we went over that. And actually, I'll go back to, to sharing my screen. Um, really, the, the best answer here is that uh, we would have uh, preparations uh, for emergency cardiopulmonary bypass in case the patient did collapse, despite our our uh, uh, preparations uh, to try to avoid that. So we ended up taking this patient to the operating room. Uh, we took her to a cardiac OR, which was adjacent to the PICU, so he, close by and with, with uh, added capability. ENT was standing by to do a rigid bronchoscopy and intubation if necessary. Cardiac surgery was involved to help us in case the patient needed to go on ECMO and cardiac anesthesia was also involved with her case. Um, she was given Presidex and Versed to, she was extremely anxious uh, as you might uh, uh, guess, uh, a patient this age who is already uh, uh, feeling like she can't breathe uh, in the addition of the operating room, she was uh, extremely uh, noticeably anxious um, and basically giving herself an epi infusion uh, on her own. Um, she was given Presidex, Versed, and uh, some ketamine 
uh, but was still wide awake and conversing with us, answering questions, and we uh, performed our procedures uh, using quarter percent marcane. We placed a right uh, pleural pigtail catheter and drained a couple of liters of uh, serous fluid. She had a right femoral percutaneous central venous catheter placed, and we did excisional biopsy of the left axillary lymph nodes that we could palpate, and the whole case took less uh, less than an hour uh, for those three procedures. Um, then she underwent a subsequent bone marrow biopsy and lumbar puncture by hematology oncology, which required some um, positioning and manipulation. And this is her x-ray <clears throat> after the, the uh, evacuation of the of the uh, uh, pleural effusion. And you can see now the full extent of the, the mass on the x-ray and um, some uh, re-expansion of her right lung, possibly with some edema. Um, so important to keep in mind. Um, so after the e after the uh, biopsies by e uh, hematology oncology, she she became more hypotensive, acidotic, and and really wasn't responding to us anymore when we were speaking to her. So the decision was made to intubate her, and ENT did that with a rigid bronchoscopy around 12:30. Um, her blood gases she was initially. Uh, I had a combined metabolic and respiratory acidosis with a base deficit of, of nine. Um, and over the course of the next uh, 45 minutes after intubation, uh, those gases started to improve. At the same time, um, she developed some hypotension. Part of the issue was that her A line that had been placed was not transducing well. Um, her non invasive cuff uh, systolic blood pressure dropped from about 130 to 70. So we were uh, concern this was definitely a real finding. She was started on pressors, epi and norepi, and given dexamethasone, um, and uh, finally was given a liter of 5% albumin and Lasix, and, and those measures um, helped to get her uh, systolic blood pressure back up to greater than 130 uh, by 130 in the afternoon, and, uh, and she was transferred back to the PICU after that, uh, still in critical condition. Um, in the PICU, uh, the, she uh, underwent an echo uh, around uh, 220, and uh, it was interpreted as showing a large pericardial effusion uh, with some features of tamponade. Um, and so uh, there was concern that she needed to have a pericardiocentesis. So the PICU performed a pericardiocentesis, which was done uh, with echo guidance. Uh, they did a bubble test where they uh, inject some air into the effusion uh, once the once they had a catheter in place and it appeared that the catheter was uh, within the effusion and they drained off a liter of blood, uh, which was concerning. Um, so she went uh, emergently back to the operating room uh, for a pericardial window and exploration by cardiac surgery. Um, she had an incision made at about 4.15, Six minutes later, she went into asystole, uh, was emergently cannulated for ECMO um, uh, within the next 10 minutes, uh, and um, the pericardiocentesis catheter was found to be penetrating the right ventricle. Uh, it was presumed to be uh, through and through placement, and the catheter was removed, and the RV was repaired, and she went back to the PICU for management. Um, her pathology ultimately uh, showed T lymphoblastic lymphoma. Um, she was on uh, CRRT and ECMO for a week, but uh, uh, then was uh, decannulated, um, was started on uh, chemotherapy, and um, she's uh, actually still in the PICU and critical, but her mass has decreased um, to uh, uh, about 20%, uh, to about 80% of what it was. It's decreased by 20%, and she is recovering. So, um, this is really, I think, a, a great uh, teaching case, uh, despite her rocky course or because of her rocky course. Um, and it's it's really a board scenario question, uh, something that we, I think, in in uh, in peds surgery, um, are in, encounter uh, almost not I wouldn't say routinely, uh, but we were consulted a lot on patients who have mediastinal masses. But rarely do they are they causing airway compression and compression of the uh, venous return to the heart. And so um, uh, most we always think about 
these measures whenever we get a consult on a patient who has an anterior mediastinal mass, um, but most often they're very stable. This patient was very different, and this is the patient that that um, you'll encounter when you have your boards potentially for some of the residents, uh, and you, you need to be able to think about the, the potential pitfalls and try to avoid them. So the concerns for, as Dr. Sung um, so nicely pointed out for us before, for a patient undergoing general anesthesia with an anterior mediastinal mass include um, decreased functional residual capacity, uh, capacity decreased lung compliance, um, because just because of the mass effect of the mass itself, loss of normal uh, bronchial smooth muscle tone, loss of the normal negative pressure on the trachea with inspiration, decreased airway diameter with positive pressure ventilation just because of the changes in laminar airflow with positive pressure ventilation compared to the negative pressure ventilation that we have physiologically, obstruction of the cava or venous return to the heart, and direct cardiac compression. So these are the considerations uh, for uh, general anesthesia and the patient undergoing uh, cardiopulmonary collapse uh, once you remove their um, their muscle tone um, and venous uh, tone. The uh, this is just a proposed algorithm um, for pa managing patients with an anterior mediastinal mass. The first row, just uh, in, in the gray blocks here, just talks about the normal consults and studies that you'd want to do. First, getting a CBC, getting hematology involved, um, doing a CT, um, a scan of the chest, um, uh, getting an echocardiogram, pulmonary function tests, if you have that opportunity. Um, we, we didn't, this patient was more urgent and needed intervention sooner than that. Um, doing bone marrow biopsy uh, and lumbar puncture for diagnostic reasons, and then a thoracentesis, consultations to anesthesia, surgery, hematology, oncology, um, interventional radiology, and pulmonology, and, and, and um, th these, are, these are for the stable patient. Um, the second row uh, in the light blue here uh, are factors uh, associated with an increased anesthetic risk for general anesthesia. So if they have a history of syn syncope, orthopnea, SVC uh, symptoms for SVC syndrome, uh, significant dyspnea, um, CT evidence of critical airway narrowing or displacement, the peak expiratory flow rate less than 50% predicted, or an abnormal echo or, and or pericardial effusion are all risk factors for complications with general anesthesia. And so in those cases, um, it's recommended that the patient undergo IR biopsy with local or an open biopsy with local in a semi Fowler's position, which is how we had our patient positioned as well. Um, if the patient requires general anesthesia, um, um, you need to be prepared for the potential complications um, and be prepared to reposition the patient to take the pressure off of uh, the venous return. Uh, so turning the patient so that the mass is displaced away from the venous return. Um, being prepared to do rigid bronchoscopy and intubation, having the groin even pre-dissected uh, for ECMO cannulation if necessary. And we had the groins, I should note, uh, prepped out, not pre-dissected, but they were prepped out uh, during our procedures. And then being prepared for emergent median sternotomy um, if, if those measures are unsuccessful in resuscitating the patient. So the emergent management of a patient uh, who's having trouble or having cardiopulmonary um, collapse during uh, workup and uh, potentially in a procedure uh, with an anterior mediastinal mass include positioning the patient to displace the mass, as I noted, to reduce its pressure on the airway or venous return, uh, prompt availability of a rigid bronchoscope, uh, anticipating the um, preparation for emergency thoracotomy to alleviate the airway obstruction, and then being ready to uh, cannulate for ECMO, which would usually do be done uh, via a groin approach. Um, so just a, a note about re-expansion pulmonary edema, which I think is uh, something that impacted this patient. Um, rarely, it follows evacuation of large volumes of pleural fluid, uh, greater than one to one and a half liters, and it happens only less than 1% of the time. Um, the proposed mechanisms include direct injury from surfactant dysfunction, increased transpleural pressures from the negative pleural pressure during the fluid removal. So if you suck off the fluid 
too quickly. You can have um, uh, uh, injury to the lung from the negative pressure created during the evacuation of the fluid, and then indirect injury from reperfusion once once that compressed lung is is opened up. Um, there's a varied clinical course. It can range from isolated radiographic changes alone to the patient having dyspnea, cough, um, hypoxemia, and then of course complete cardiopulmonary collapse. And I, I don't think that this patient uh, had cardiopulmonary collapse alone from the ev rapid evacuation of the pericardial effusion, but it certainly didn't help her to have this re-expansion pulmonary edema. So, um, you know, I'll ask Dr. Sung to comment on that as well. Uh, what are your feelings about way? What are your feelings about the uh, the uh, uh, impact of her re-expansion pulmonary edema on this case? Hi, thanks, Pete. Uh, Tony, um, uh, when I um, we reviewed the temporal sequence of events, it appears that uh, within half an hour after the chest plays and drainage, the patient gets progressively more uh, restless and uh, and with crackling, you know, while she's breathing. When she's breathing, and uh, while we uh, are proceeding on the third phase of the procedure, exolithoplasty after the chest chain and thermal line place, she progressively, you know, uh, in addition of uh, Presidex and uh, midazolam, that uh, we were somewhat forced to give her additional sedation academy in order to accomplish the appropriate uh, stillness and sedation, you know, have that biopsy done. Uh, it's clear to us that uh, her respiratory status is getting worse. And then we were really concerned about our re-expansion pulmonary edema. And uh, as soon as the actual level biopsy is done while we're doing the last phase of the procedure, it's clear to us that uh, she's uh, going on impending a respiratory failure and, and quite possibly have a circuitry collapse if we don't intervene. And that leads to your subsequent presentation about 90 minutes after the chest strain, uh, we asked the ENT surgeons to assist her securing the airway. And about, you know, um, 30 minutes from that, uh, we proceed to uh, the various blood tests that we've seen. Uh, cardiac surgeon was consulted, you know, as far as uh, whether we should do emergency ECMO in the first day of surgery, uh, which later on the third blood test showed there's some improvement. There are about 300 cc of serosanguinous fluid coming out from the endotracheal tube. So I think the patient's hypotension is real. I think in part due to the transduction of the fluid into a lung. Um, and, you know, there's no clear evidence, you know, as far as like, what is a clear amount of uh, fluid once it drains safely, as you have pointed out, you know, the expansion pulmonary edema is rare. And, um, you know, various mechanisms have been proposed, clamping fluid, avoids negative, you know, pressure and drainage and all that. Um, at, at the end of the day, you know, this is a very difficult situation. Uh, I'm glad that uh, we have all the, you know, subspecialists standing by to get ready for the interview at the appropriate time. Thank you. So if you if you could do it over again, Tony, would you have drained it slower? Like would you have done 500 cc's at a time? Like would you change anything, or is this just one of those things that happens and it's terrible, but you can't really predict? No, I think that's a great question, Dr. Rosen. I, I you know, I I think, um, and the answer is I don't know. Uh, I think I probably would have drained a, a liter and stopped if I had to do it again. Um, you know, we actually talked about it during the during the actual drainage. Um, Dr. Sung actually. Uh, asked uh, appropriately, should we be draining the whole effusion? And my thought at that time was this patient needed room in her chest uh, to allow for venous return. And I, I thought that if we didn't give her as much room as possible, she'd probably be worse off. Um, I think, um, and I, you know, obviously don't have a crystal ball, but I think if we had drained half the fluid and drained a liter, that we probably, she probably would have had a similar course, and then we would have been asked to drain the rest of the fluid because she would have had some deterioration, and we probably would have ended up in the same spot. I think it's important to think about, um, and I, I kind of in my mind, think about patients like this, like a semi driving down the road, and you, you swerve to avoid something in the road, and the back of the truck starts to shake a little bit, and then you try to correct, and it shakes a little bit more, and pretty soon you're out of control, and you're off the road, overturned, jackknife, and and I think that you know small moves um, can help sometimes to avoid 
um, bad complications. So in that respect, yeah, probably I would have drained a little bit less. We could always drain more, you know. So there's there's a question, uh, Dr. Dross, too, about if the plural drainage was uh, the plural fusion was drained with a vacuum bottle or gravity or how that was done. No, it was just drained to gravity. In fact, um, we we lost a lot right on the on the bed initially. Um, um, just getting it hooked up, it, you know, it came, it was under pressure, so it came out of the pigtail, and this was a 12 French pigtail, so it wasn't huge, um, but we lost a lot just under pressure getting hooked up to the Pluravac, and then it was just hooked directly to a Pluravac uh, to gravity, actually. We didn't even uh, have it to suction initially. So, no, we didn't, we didn't suck it out. It just drained by gravity. So again, um, just the imaging findings for re-expansion pulmonary edema include um, some ipsilateral ground glass opacities, um, septal thickening, full consolidation, atelectasis, and the outcome when occurring in isolation, not a patient like this, um, would be uh, potentially self-limited. Uh, mortality rate is less than 5% and treatment for it is usually supportive. Um, just a quick note about pericardiocentesis, and I think that you know, um, I, I I almost thought about leaving this part of the uh, of the presentation out because I I didn't want to um, present a complication that wasn't my own. But I think the learning point is so important uh, to realize the the potential um, complications of a pericardiocentesis. Um, you know, it 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 certainly is one of the um, well documented and well recognized um, potential complications is injury to the heart. And so um, just the technique for a classic sub xiphoid approach for a pericardiocentesis is uh, to insert the needle between the xiphoid process and the costal margin uh, with a 30 to 45 degree angle towards the left mid clavicle. And that usually allows you to get into the pericardial space um, and aspirating as you advance the needle into the pericardial fluid. Then if you're gonna um, leave a catheter uh, doing that be a cell your technique, advancing a wire through the needle into the pericardial effusion um, and, um, you know, potentially doing the bubble test as they did to try to confirm that they were in the effusion. They were doing this under ultrasound guidance, really with all the precautions in place and still ended up uh, placing the catheter through the right ventricle. Um, you know, a big, um, you know, when aspirating the pericardial fluid, it, even if it's sanguineous, uh, it should be non-clotting fluid. Um, if it's clotting fluid, you might worry more about a uh, direct injury to the ventricle, and certainly pulling off a liter of blood um, should should uh, give some uh, concern for a cardiac injury. And 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 this was immediately recognized and, and handled appropriately uh, by taking the patient, uh, you know, back for an exploration. So, um, I think the the big takeaways for this case. Uh, in a patient like this is really to be prepared to um, encounter the potential pitfalls, as we mentioned, uh, for patients with an anterior mediastinal mass, uh, which uh, can range from nothing to complete cardiopulmonary collapse. And I'll, I'll take any other questions. Tony, how, how, how do you get to this point with these patients? Like, I mean, they show up and they're basically ready to fall off a cliff, right? She came in and was sick when she started. Is it that kids physiologically, as these things are growing, can just adapt so easily and so they're less symptomatic? Is it that they're ignoring things? Like, how, how does it get to this point? Yeah, and that, that's a great point. Uh, pediatric patients in general have tremendous reserve, um, and they will continue to peter along until they reach that cliff, and then they have a very sudden decompensation. Um, that being said, this this patient really is the first patient that I've had where um, in my career where they've like checked all the boxes for you know needing potential cardiopulmonary bypass and and all the preparations that that I laid out. Most of the time when we get called about a patient with an anterior mediastinal mass, they they have it. Anesthesia is appropriately concerned. But the patient has no symptoms of dyspnea when lying flat. They really have no symptoms at all, um, and they, you know, may have had um, other B symptoms potentially of lymphoma, and and ended up getting a chest X-ray or chest chest CT, and the mass is noted that way almost incidentally. 
Um, and there's no airway compression, no venous compression on the CT scan. And those patients we still do under local in the operating room, but we don't have their groins prepped out for ECMO. Um, and, you know, maybe we should, but I think that uh, in general, um, this, this patient is at the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of how severe she presented, um, you know, and she had been having symptoms really. Um, this Bell's palsy was is presumed to be a Horner syndrome from compression uh, of of her uh, sympathetic chain. Um, and th that was, you know, over a month before she presented. So it really, she'd been having this going on for quite some time. But I, I think it's a great case for, you know, it's a great refresher for, for anyone who will potentially encounter patients like this. And I think it's great for the residents really to see this in action. Uh, we did have some residents who were involved with the case. And I think that, uh, you know, seeing it helps you really to remember it uh, when the time comes again that you encounter a patient like this and you know automatically what you need to do uh, and and it can potentially save life. And despite all the complications that happen with this patient, we were prepared for the majority of them. And, uh, and although she's still critical, she is still alive and hopefully is going to recover from this. Um, but it, it, it's definitely a long road. And I think she's only in the place she is right now because of all the preparations and particularly by our, our anesthesia team and, and our uh, cardiac surgery team, just the communication and the, the, the whole setup and coordination of her care from the beginning. I mean, uh, I, I, we, this patient came in in the evening, the night before. Um, I learned about her that morning. And then by 10 o'clock, we were in the operating room. So it really was a very rapid uh, coordinated response uh, with with excellent uh, preparation and care by everybody who was involved. So I think that's the other key is to really involve everybody that you need. It, if you don't need it and it ends up getting people mobilized for, for nothing, then so be it. But when you need it, it has to be available right away. I think those are some great closing points, Tony. And I think that's really important for the residents, like you said. One, the physiologic changes that you saw and that you, you, you were prepared for, I think, can you know, you don't have, it's not a, this isn't a thing that you have time to stop and read a book and figure out what are the things that I should be doing. You got to know this and be, and be ready to go. And, and it's one of those things, like you said, if it's, if it's boring and all the preparations are for nothing, you're happy. And so I think, I think being prepared, like you said, is a paramount importance. So thanks so much, Dr. DeRoss, for a great presentation, great conversation. Uh, as a monthly reminder, we meet every Friday, except the first Friday of the month, going through all the general surgery subspecialties. Thanks again to our corporate sponsor, Medtronic. And we'll be right back here next week. Um, our group in uh, Cleveland Clinic, Florida, led by Dr. Raul Rosenthal, will be talking about the management of high-grade dysphagia after recurrent hiatal hernia repair with a slipped Nissen fund application. So thanks again to everybody. Thanks to Dr. Ross, and we'll see you next week on Surgery Live. Mm -hmm.